Hey guys and welcome back to a new episode of Philips Android News, which is the format where I go over all important changes that somehow affect us Android developers, no matter if that's a new Kotlin version, a new Android Studio version, some cool changes to the Android ecosystem, Google Play changes, whatever it is, I will research it all for you, summarize it in one episode, so you can easily follow that once a month and be up to date as an Android developer, so you know which topics actually make sense to dive into and which are rather not so important for you. Because let's be honest, staying up to date as an Android developer is quite hard. And this time for June's episode, I will summarize all changes from May. And I can already tell you there are a lot of cool changes this time. So let's immediately dive into it. The first awesome change is that Kotlin 2.0 is now out. So this is actually huge because it brings a lot of cool changes to Kotlin. On the one hand, we have a new Kotlin compiler Compiler. So JetPrint has been working on the K2 compiler, so a second version, second generation of the Kotlin compiler, which is just much better. According to them, it promises twice the compilation speed as the previous compiler, so we get faster Gradle builds overall. But apart from that, it also brings some other changes, specifically language and Kotlin multi-platform changes. One thing you need in order to use this new compiler is you need at least Gradle version 8.3 or more. But if you have that, you can run the stable K2 compiler. So let's go over which other changes this new compiler brings. On the one hand, we have lots of smart casting improvements. So in case you don't know that, smart casting is a feature the compiler can use that if you cast an object in your code to a specific type, then that the compiler is smart enough to recognize that you casted it before and that it can treat this object only as the type of object you casted it to in the following code. So in Kotlin, that is typically applied in when expressions, for example. So you say when animal is dog, and if it's a dog, then you have access to the bark function, for example. Since the compiler knows, okay, if it's a dog, then it must also have the functions a dog has. And with the new K2 compiler, there are just now improvements to how smart the smart casting feature of the compiler is. The detailed scenarios in which that now also works can be found on the JetBrains site. I won't go over that in detail here because those are just a bunch of smaller examples and code snippets you can go into. But be aware, there are some improvements now. Then the new compiler also brings some Kotlin multi-platform improvements. So on Kotlin multi-platform, we have one common source set, so just a folder, a directory, which contains the code we want to share between platforms, so the common code, and it has some platform-specific source sets, so one for Android code, one for iOS code, desktop code, web code, and so on. And previously, these source sets were separated in a project hierarchy, but the Kotlin compiler wasn't able to really separate these during compilation. And this just could lead you to access a function that is written in the platform-specific code from the common code, which shouldn't be possible, since in the end, the common code can't know which platform it's running on. And this is now fixed with some redesigns of the compiler. Then next up, Kotlin 2.0 also brings a new Gradle plugin called Power Assert. And as you can already guess, this plugin is useful for testing. Since when you run an assertion like, okay, this value needs to be true, and that assertion fails, you normally, with a default framework, you're not able to tell why that failed. So you're required to actually dive into your code and inspect that. But with this new Power Assert plugin, it will just include uh, variable values, it will include sub-expressions just in the final lock trace, so you can inspect such failed assertions faster. So in the end, when a test fails and you're using this Gradle plugin, you will now know better why it failed. So how do you now use Kotlin 2.0.0 and how do you use this new K2 compiler? Pretty simple, the Kotlin version you can just update in your product settings, so in the version catalog, but in order to also use it with the K2 compiler, you need to go to your Android Studio settings, search for K2, and then there is some kind of uh, checkbox you need to opt in at this present moment. All right, so much about Kotlin version 2.0.0. Next change, Google I.O. Google I.O. is a yearly event by Google where they announce all the hottest new shit from the Android and Google ecosystem. And this time, there are again some very cool announcements. On the one hand, and this is one that I'm particularly excited about, Kotlin multi-platform is now officially supported by Google. So as you maybe know, Kotlin multi-platform itself is a technology by JetBrains, so by the same guys who make these cool IDEs like Android Studio, IntelliJ, and so on. But now Google, so the company behind Android, decided to officially support Kotlin multi-platform with their Jetpack libraries. So that means that all Jetpack libraries we currently know, so things like uh, Room, things like Jetpack View Model, Jetpack Lifecycle, things like Jetpack Navigation Compose, all those libraries we have in the Jetpack set will be gradually migrated to also work for Kotlin multi-platform and they will be maintained by Google. And a lot of them already support Kotlin multi-platform and for those that don't yet, the, the support will follow in future. If we take a look online, there have been lots of discussions about, okay, what does that now mean for Flutter? Because Flutter in the end is a technology 
owned by Google, while Kotlin multi-platform is a technology not owned by Google, and they still decide to support it. So Flutter developers have been a little bit afraid due to that change. But if you say, okay, that's actually something I'd be interested in, in, in my opinion, about what I think about Kotlin multi-platform versus Flutter, what I think will the future be in regards to cross-platform mobile development, then just let me know that down below and I will make a video. Then the next cool changes on Google I.O. were changes to Jetpack Compose. On the one hand, we now have a way to implement shared element transitions on uh, Jet in Jetpack Compose, which I already made a video about, so I will keep this a little bit shorter here, but there is now a way to have shared element transitions. So we have one element that transitions into another element on a second screen, and that is now in beta. And then we are finally able to also fully animate list changes in the lazy column in Compose. Since previously, these list item animations were really limited, and now we're able to also animate adding new messages or adding new items to a list, removing items from a list, and reordering items. And in order to use that, you can just use the animate item modifier and apply that to the item in your lazy column. Just make sure you also have keys assigned to your items in the lazy column. Another change that affects Compose is that we can now display HTML inside of a text composable. And the way this works is with annotated strings. So annotated strings were the kind of data structure that Compose uses in order to display formatted strings. So where parts of the string are bold, some parts are italic, some parts might have a different color. And constructing these annotated strings was always a little bit paying lots of boilerplate code, but now there is a way to actually generate such an annotated string out of basic HTML formatting. So you can just use annotated string dot from HTML, paste your formatted HTML code with a text with your normal, um, I don't know, underline tags with your bold tags with a specific color, and the from HTML function will then take this HTML code and transform it in, in an uh, annotated string, which will be displayed in your text composable. So you just need less code overall to format text and compose. Then we also got two new composables. On the one hand, the contextual flow row and contextual flow column. Those are pretty much just two new layouts which extend the behavior of the already existing flow row and flow column. So flow row, in case you are not aware of that, is really just a layout. Uh, that um, aligns items in the flow row horizontally, at least as long as they fit in a single row. If an item does not fit in that single row anymore, it will jump to the next line. And that was already possible in Compose, but now with these two contextual flow rows and columns, we have the option to also implement these as a lazy layout. So where only those items will be drawn on the screen, that are actually visible. Then we have another change regarding Compose, and that is that the strong skipping mode is now enabled. And not only enabled, but production ready. So what the heck is a strong skipping mode? That is in the end a new mode the Jetpack Compose runtime will use to allow unstable composables to still be skipped. So in the end, to really just keep this very short, when state, compose state changes in the compose hierarchy, then the compose runtime will try to figure out which composables actually are affected by that state change, which composables need to be recomposed, and all those composables that are not affected by that state change would just look exactly as they uh, did before, and they are skipped. But due to the internal workings of how this runtime actually uh, checked if certain state changed or not, we sometimes needed those stable and uh, immutable annotations on our compose state, depending on the data structures we used. And if we didn't do that, we just got some performance issues in our code. But now with this new strong skipping mode, even those composables that use unstable state, so state where the compose runtime can't tell for sure if it changed or not, even those can now be skipped by the compose runtime, meaning you will get less recompositions and a better performance overall. And we are still not done with compose changes. There are more. Another thing that sounds boring at first, but is actually a really cool and important change, is that the compose compiler now moves into the official Kotlin repository. And do you know why that's a cool change? Because in the past, you know, when we actually updated our Kotlin version, then that was always coming also with a change in the Compose compiler version. This is this little field you probably face in Android project like a Kotlin Compose compiler extension or so, where you always needed to research, look up on Google, look up in their compatibility map, which specific Compose compiler version actually matches your Kotlin version. And this is now over because since the Compose compiler was moved into inside of the Kotlin repository, that means if there is a new Kotlin version that's shipped, it will automatically also come with a new Compose compiler version, version that's sh uh, shipped. Because if a new Kotlin version is shipped, it will automatically come with a new Compose compiler version that comes with it. So we don't need to specify that version on our own anymore. We don't get any build issues because of that. That is really great. And do you know what? I got more Compose stuff. There is one last 
super cool thing that I have to share here. Super cool change regarding Compose. I also already made a video about that, so I will also keep this one short. But what should I say, guys? String routes have an end. The official Compose navigation library now supports type safe navigation, type safe argument passing. It was always such, such a pain to set up proper navigation destinations in a Compose project with the official navigation library. We needed to define our route pattern. We then needed to define which arguments we had, which types this argument had, if they were nullable, if they had default values. We needed to remember the same format our route needs to be in. We needed to also uh, and properly encode maybe strings if they had spaces, if they had slashes in them, since our routes were URLs in the end. But on Android, we are not on web. We are on Android and we don't need URLs. And now in the official Compose Navigation Library, we have a way to um, pass data in a type safe manner. That means we just define data classes. These data classes have parameters. These parameters have specific types. They could be nullable, could not be nullable. They could have default values. And then if we want to navigate to that route, we can only pass the specific types the route actually needs without running into any weird runtime issues. All that works with Kotlin serialization under the hood, so you do need that Gradle plugin in order to make that work, but I think it's best if you just check my recent video about that. But I have more. I have more. Not about Compose. We're done with Compose, at least the cool stuff about it. But we have more news. And the next thing I want to talk about is that the Android 15 version is now in the second beta. So Google just announced a few new features the new Android 15 will actually have, a few new things that will change for us developers. And I again summarize the most important ones here for you. On the one hand, we have more limitations as usual. There is no Android version that's coming out without more developer limitations. And those new limitations mostly affect foreground services here, which have already been limited quite a bit in the past, but now there are more limitations to it. It's not too bad, to be honest. So um, if we take a look at what those limitations actually are, um, they only affect data sync and media processing foreground services. So data sync should be self-explanatory. So when you sync some kind of data to a server and do that in a foreground service or media processing. So when you need to process some media files, I don't know, convert images or whatever that could be. These services now have a timeout of six hours. So that means if you launch a foreground service with one of these two types and it does its job for longer than six hours, Android will make that service time out. And if a foreground service times out, that doesn't mean it's immediately killed or so, but it will no longer be considered a foreground service by the system. So it will just be considered a normal service at that point. And normal services can be killed much, much easier than foreground services by the system. So if your service turns into normal service and the system is then hungry for memory, your service can be killed. But let's also talk about a cool new change. And that is that there is a modernization of the Compose canvas going on or just the general Android canvas. Since that will then give us a four by four matrix, which sounds very mathematical and boring, but it's really cool because with a four by four matrix, what we can do is we can do transformations in the 3D space. So what we do on a canvas is usually just drawing something in 2D. But with this new matrix that will allow us to transform specific canvas coordinates in the end to 3D space. Then the next change that Android 15 will bring is a so-called private space. So that means that Android as a system gets it on kind of incognito mode. So you can think of this private space as a separate user space. So a separate user profile on your Android device, which requires authentication. So maybe um, biometric authentication with your fingerprint or typing a password or so. So only the person who should access that private profile is allowed to do so. And this private space can be in a locked state. So you can actively lock this. In that case, no apps will be active anymore in that private space. And also no apps will be able to send you notifications. And that also means that all the settings and recently used apps for the uh, private space won't show up in the uh, normal view. This suddenly enables completely new types of apps for Android users, but I will personally just use this for family pictures. All right, last change that's relevant to talk about for Android 15, that is that predictive back gestures are now the default. So predictive back gestures have been announced before already, but till now that was always a developer setting. You needed to opt into that, but now it's the default. So what is that actually? Uh, Android changes the way how we navigate back in apps. So if we navigate back and swipe, then with predictive back gestures, it gives the user kind of a hint of where they actually get 
when they perform that back navigation. And that's just now the default with Android 15. Cool, so we're done with Android 15, we're done with the Google I.O., we're done with Kotlin 2.0.0. I have one more little category I really want to talk about, and that is again for Jetpack Compose. Um, it's nothing that was announced during Google I.O., so I made that a separate category, but we have new adaptive layouts, and I really like them. And I also have made videos about two of those actually already, but what does that mean? So with Android, we have an adaptive library that brings mostly layouts that adapt to all those different screen sizes that are out there. Um, so mobile phones, tablets, uh, foldables, I don't know, um, desktops, which by default is of course the pain to support all these and make your UI look good on all of these uh, different screen types. But these adaptive layouts do that for you for common types of screens. For example, for list and detail screens. While on mobile devices, a list and detail screen is usually just one list screen and one detail screen. If we take a look at that on a tablet, then there is enough space so we can have list and detail screen on one page. So depending on the device you're on, the layout will arrange your two screens in the right way so it's nicely visible for the user. So you have this new navigable uh, list detail pane scaffold, which is a terrible name to be honest, but it is how it is. Um, you have some kind of a supporting pane scaffold, which is also, uh, which has a similar purpose. And you have a navigation suite scaffold, which I also have a video about already. Um, that is a scaffold uh, that will work well with these typical material, uh, material three navigation components. So we have the navigation bottom bar, which is typically used on phones. We have the navigation rail, which is a rail on the left side of the screen for tablets. And we have a navigation drawer, which uh, is for rather large screens. But all those composables have in common uh, that they are meant to navigate between pages. And this navigation suite scaffold will just switch to the right type of navigation composable depending on the right screen size. So all in all, I think those are really cool changes. Definitely something I would check out if I were you, for example, by watching my previous videos. And I really tried to not make this episode longer than necessary because there were a lot of more changes, but I tried to condense what I considered important, what I considered exciting into this episode. So you are more up to date than before, hopefully. Awesome, thanks for watching. If you want to learn more about Android, more advanced courses, you'll find them down below as usual. And I will see you back in the next video. Have an amazing rest of your week. Bye bye.